Thank you for taking the gentle comment in the morning uh, in the right way. Yeah. I am often in trouble for making these spontaneous remarks, uh, particularly from my good wife. And uh, yeah, why don't you keep to your notes? I don't know. Anyway, it's lovely to be here with you. And I know that each of you have uh, burdens that are unique to yourself and challenges that are unique to yourself. And you might be thinking you're the only person with that particular challenge. And you may well be. But it's wonderful to know that there's one who understands, who has a fellow feeling with us in our infirmities. I don't understand you. In fact, I don't understand myself. But he does. And he has promised to be with us here this evening as we seek to worship him. Our call to worship is... I don't know if it's coming up up there or not, but if it's not, I find it. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13, and it's verses 15 to 16. Here. And pay attention. Do not be arrogant. For the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God. Before he brings the darkness. Before your feet stumble on the darkening hills. You hope for light but he will turn it to utter darkness and change it to deep gloom. The words I wanted to draw your attention to there were the first line of verse 15. Hear and pay attention. And the first line of verse 16, give glory to the Lord your God. And in dependence upon him, we will seek to do that as we come to our first item of praise, which is from Sing Psalm, Psalm 40, verses 1 through 5. Let us stand to sing. <coughs> Yeah. 
Let us pray together. We have been confessing here in the last minute something wonderful. Draw our attention to it and lead us into a belief in it. Your plans for us are more wonderful than we can understand. And Lord, we find ourselves so utterly hopeless and helpless in ourselves. We realize to some degree that we have come short of what your word requires and that we have neglected the first things and that we have been forgetful and selfish. Grant that an understanding of that would bring us to see our need of who you are and what you promised and to praise you this evening for your mercy to us. It is of your mercy we got up the steps. It's of your mercy that we got out of bed this morning. It's of your mercy that we are here. It is of your mercy that we are not consumed. Bring us to praise you for your mercy and to thank you that you've made it clear that you delight in mercy and bring us this evening to delight in mercy also. And to know what it is to say with David, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Lord, it's a mystery to us the way you do work things for us. We find ourselves in one difficulty and one challenge and one problem after another. You tell us uh, through your servant Job that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards. And yet in our trouble and challenges, we have a helper. And Lord, we find ourselves crying to you, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. And we use often the language of your word addressing that request to you. But grant that we would not just merely ask you to hear us, but that we would be resolved in our own hearts and minds this evening to hear you, to say again with the psalmist, I will hear what God is saying. And you are saying to us, so much, so full, and so opposite to our situation. We've been hearing about meetings going on in the congregation here. We pray for a renewed commitment to yourself, that the joy of the Lord would be the strength of the people here, that they would be knit together in love and be able to recognize in one another the graces you have given to each other. We pray that we would have the right attitude, that we would be following Jesus in all of that. Lord, we believe that you have a man for this pulpit. And we see from outside, as it were, the challenges that there have been in us finding what you would have them to do. We pray that you would provide for them as you have promised to provide all, your need, all their needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. We would particularly pray for dear Finlay in his uh, 
health challenges and in his spirit that he would be upheld and know in a fresh way where the everlasting arms are, that they are underneath. We remember others who are frail, those who are neglecting the means of grace. We remember those who are at home this evening, whose heart is towards this place. Grant them your spirit as they listen, that they would join in worship and be thankful. We pray for our communities. We remember our hospitals struggling to attend to the needs of so many people. Lord, there's so much to pray for. Give us to be a people of prayer who pour our hearts out to you morning, noon, and night. Open our hearts to receive out of your fullness this evening and to say, God is good. Keep us and pardon us. For Jesus' sake, amen. And we would like to read with you the book of Jeremiah, chapter 12. Jeremiah, chapter 12. And I don't know about you, but if you're like me, you'll be somebody who's had a complaint about something this week. Well, here's Jeremiah's complaint. You're always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet, I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them. They take root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet, you know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land lie parched and the grass in every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked, the animals and birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, he will not see what happens to us. And here's God's answer. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets of the Jordan? Your relatives, members of your own family, even they have betrayed you. They have raised a loud cry against you. Don't trust them, though they speak well of you. I'll forsake my house, abandon my inheritance. I will give the one I live, love into the hands of her enemies. My inheritance has become to me like a lion in the forest. She roars at me. Therefore, I hate her. Has not my inheritance become to me like a speckled bird of prey that other birds of prey surround and attack? Go and gather all the wild beasts. Bring them to devour. Many shepherds will ruin my vineyard and trample down my field. They will turn my pleasant field into a desolate wasteland it will be made a wasteland, parched and desolate before me. The whole land will be laid waste because there is no one who cares. Over all the barren heights in the desert, destroyers will swarm. For the sword of the Lord will devour from one end of the land to the other. No one will be safe. They will sow wheat, reap thorns. They will wear themselves out but gain nothing. They will bear the shame of their harvest because of the Lord's fierce anger. 
This is what the Lord says. As for all my wicked neighbors who seize the inheritance I gave to my people, I will uproot them from their lands and will uproot the people of Judah from among them. But after I uproot them, I will again have compassion and will bring each of them back to their own inheritance and their own country. And if they learn well the ways of my people and swear by my name, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, even as they once taught my people to swear by Baal, then they will be established among my people. But if any nation does not listen, I will completely uproot and destroy it, declares the Lord. And may God add his blessing to our reading of that solemn chapter. And we'll turn again to sing in the psalm of complaint, probably one of the best known psalms in that respect, Psalm 13, and we're singing it from the Scottish Psalter to God's praise. How long wilt thou forget me?
you have it. What would you say if I said, that's it? Well, you've had it. That psalm is so pregnant with glorious truth for you in your complaint. And you have professed this, verse 5. I have all my confidence placed in your mercy. If that's where you are, if you're saying that from the depth of your being, of your heart, all is well. And you can finish that verse and say, my heart within me shall rejoice regardless. Rejoice in your salvation regardless of the mess you see around you, the mess you see in yourself. How differently you and I would write the book of the providence of life. The turns and roundabouts that you have experienced. Think about Job, subject to satanic attack. He lost everything. His wife, his friends, his body, his farm. And yet he was saying in the midst of that, God, even if you slay me, I'll trust in you. And he could say, although worms shall destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. A lady who was here this morning, she's not here this evening, so I can mention it. A lovely old lady, you probably know who she is. She said, it was just wonderful to have the subject of death addressed. And here it is again in that verse. Although worms destroy this body. That's Job. Then Paul called in a most amazing way. And there he is now in the stocks in Philippi. And what did he say? I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So are you content? Learn to be content. And this evening we would like to look at the subject of persevering through difficulty. And Jeremiah is one of the prime examples of that. He had 40 years of banging his head against a brick wall. He did not have things easy. No response to his work virtually other than opposition. Look at him there in verse 1. Why do the wicked prosper? Why are all these wicked, why are all my neighbors succeeding and seem to have everything going Hunky dory. Now we're not saying Jeremiah was right in what he was saying, Lord, pull them out like sheep ready for the slaughter. So there was Jeremiah, it, just not understanding his circumstances. And what did God say to him? Look at verse 5. You're just dealing with men just now. 
Wait till you have to contend with horses or even more. Wait till you face the Jordan of death. How will you manage in the thickets of the Jordan? If you think you've got something bothering you now, just you wait. In other words, God is saying to him, your circumstances <coughs> might get a lot worse. What a struggle Jeremiah had. Now, I'm, I'm going here, there, and everywhere with verses from Jeremiah, so I'm not anticipating you'll be, you need to look them up, but they're there. Jeremiah 7, verse 16, don't pray for these people. My. Don't intercede for them. It's there in chapter 11. It's there in chapter 14. And here's what God says to him in chapter 15. Even if Moses and Samuel ask me on your behalf, I wouldn't listen. That's tough. And then God says to him, but go on, get on with your work. Get on with what you're supposed to be. Remember what I said to you in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. I have ordained you a prophet. Whatever I command thee, thou shalt speak. I am with thee. I have put my Words in thy mouth, I'll make you, this is chapter 15, verse 20, I'll make you as bold as a wall. Yes, you've got problems, and they're going to get worse. But I'm with you. I'll make you as bold as a wall. How lonely poor Jeremiah was. There were three things he was not allowed to do. And they're all in chapter 16. Don't get married, Jeremiah, in case people think there's a future. Don't mourn for them or with them because I have no comfort for them, verse 5. And don't go to a party. Don't go to a party, verse 8. That was tough, wasn't it? You're going to have a tough time, Jeremiah. And my, how he had a tough time. He had external sufferings. This is what he said. I haven't done anyone any harm, yet everyone curses me. Chapter 15, verse 10. They made jokes about him. At first he didn't realize that, but then he found they were making jokes about him. They put him in the stocks and Neck irons like a madman, chapter 20, verse 2. They put him in a muddy dungeon with deep mud. 36, verse 8. They put him in a well, a wet, wet well, and the water was lapping over his head. You'll find that in Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 54. So he had external sufferings, in his circumstances, folks around him, his providential situation was very tough. But he had internal suffering too. It, it, it got to him in his mind and in his spirit. Listen to him in chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head were a well and mine eyes like a fountain, that I would weep day and night. 
for what's happened. I was reading this afternoon about the South African Andrew Murray, who was a remarkable guy. Uh, Andrew Murray, he, I think he wrote 300 books. He was, uh, he was a Scot, actually, from a farm in Aberdeenshire. But he would spend nights, nights crying, for the Lord to appear in his glory, and he did. Well, here's Jeremiah. I would weep day and night. So he had external sufferings and internal sufferings. He was up and down. He had mood swings. Here's him in chapter 20, verse 7. Lord, you have deceived me. I am derided daily. People mock me. They don't understand me, and I don't understand myself. And I feel like giving it all up. Does that ring any bells? I feel like giving it all up, it's useless. But he doesn't stop there. There's a but. Here it is. Your word is in my heart as a fire in my bones. I cannot stop. I have to. To whom can I go? I can't go anywhere else. We sang it so beautifully. Well, I don't know about the quality of the singing, but the words. In that psalm, the turning point of that psalm is a little word, my. David, why are you complaining to a God you think is not listening? To a God you think has forgotten you. Why are you doing that? It's because, verse 3, I think it is, he's my God. I can't go anywhere else. That's him down. Then he's up. Verse 11, chapter 20. The Lord is with me. Verse 13, sing unto the Lord, praise the Lord. Verse 14, he's down again, chapter 20. He's down again. Can you imagine this? This is what he says. Cursed be the day I was born. Cursed be the man who told my dad that I was about to be born. He knew what it was to be up and down. He had difficulties, emotional swings. But before the people, he was always bold. His, his grumblings, his complaints, his expressions of dismay were alone before God. Look at him there in chapter 12, the, the chapter we read. Lord, you're righteous, but I want to talk with you about your justice. I, I need a word with you, God, about your justice. Why do bad people have such a good time? And why do bad things happen to good people? Does that remind you of Psalm 73? That reminds me of it. The 
the great worship leader. Asa, my feet were almost gone. I envied the wicked. They have no problem. Here's what Asa said. It's been in vain that I've gone to church so often. It's been in vain that I've tried to hold family worship. It's been in vain all that I've done to try and serve you. All the work I've done cleaning the floors in the church, doing the Sunday school, leading the singing, it's all in vain. That's Asa. And perhaps there's something of that in yourself and myself. And he goes on in chapter 12 saying, God, why don't you sort these folks out? Now, that's pride in Jeremiah. Who am I to criticize Jeremiah? But he shouldn't be saying that. But that's what he said. He's real. He's true. He's telling you and telling us what's in his heart. You know, God, that they're sinners. You know the way they're behaving. Drag them out a sheep for the butcher. It's there too. I think it's chapter 17, verse 18. Let my persecutors be put to shame. Bring on them the day of disaster. Destroy them with Double destruction. I think it's in chapter 18 too, if I remember. 18, verse 23. Don't forgive their crimes. Deal with them in the time of your anger. My, he was right in the pits, wasn't he? God's solution. Toughen up, Jeremiah. Stop looking for self-pity. Stop being preoccupied about yourself. Stop looking for the easy, easy option. You're not exempt from difficulties. And this is the message, I trust, of what I'm trying to say this evening. You're not exempt from difficulties, but you're equipped for them. Paul to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall... Finish the verse. You need to know it. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall have a cushy time. Shall... Suffer persecution. And Jeremiah, forget yourself. You're going to have difficulties, but you're equipped for them. Go and preach. Heal the sick. Isn't that what Jesus said too? Yeah, there's it. It's in, it's in Mar Matthew, I think it is. Matthew chapter 10. Go and preach. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Oh man, that's good. I would like to be involved in that. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. That's great. That's in verse 10, but verse 16 is coming. Matthew 10, verse 16 says, I send you out a sheep in the midst of wolves. You're not exempt from difficulties and challenges, but you are equipped for it. Sheep 
but there's woo. Whenever God is doing something, and I think, I hope, and I trust that this may have some application to yourselves as individuals, but more especially to yourselves as a congregation. When God is doing something, things are tough. And I was thinking about it this afternoon. I was thinking about Abraham. God took him out one nice, nice night and said, Hey, how many stars are there up there? Abraham said, Lots. Lots of them. God said to him, Your wife's going to have a son. And your seed will be like the stars. What? My wife is 65 and we've no children. The Bible says of Abraham that he was as good as dead. And it says of Sarah, she was worn out. And if I had heard that message from God, you're going to have seed like the sand on the seashore, like the scars in the sky. If I was Abraham, I'd have said, well, good. That's going to start in nine months' time. But there was nothing. Nothing happened for 10 years. Things were difficult. We'll do our own thing. We, we, we'll sort it. We know God's promise, but we can wait. Then bring in Hagar, and Ishmael appears. She was pregnant. Now we have Abraham. He's, he's 100, and she's 90. And we've got a son. Ah. Things are mending. We've got a son. Offer him as a sacrifice. Take the knife to him. And he took the knife. And do you know what God says? It's a lovely expression. Now I know you fear God. Now I know. I know where your commitment is at last. Now I know you've taken the knife. But I have provided a lamb. So, Isaac comes back down the hill and everything seems hunky-dory, we might say. And what's then? Well, Abraham becomes 140. And Isaac is 40. And he ain't got a wife. He finds Rebecca. Now, surely, the family will come. No. Abraham dies. Twenty years later, something happened. Twenty years later. Rebecca had twins. Twenty years after getting married. God's always doing something significant in his own time for his own glory, which you may and do not understand, he does. He knows the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And all of Abraham's story for all these years and all these diversions to, to Hagar and up the hill with the knife and all of that is leading to the promised Messiah. Abraham saw it in the promise and was glad. 
Whenever God is doing something, it's tough. God's clocks are different from yours and mine. How slowly things moved to Calvary. God has a perfect plan. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where is God in Jeremiah's case? He was called clearly. You can read that in chapter 1. After 40 years, no one was listening. He had nothing to show from it. Remember the king, Jehoiakim, got his message and cut it up and threw it in the fire. That's in chapter 40. And yet in the middle of it, God was saying to him, I have loved you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You know that verse. You treasure that verse. Friend, don't just treasure it. Live in the light of it as you face your challenges and your problems. Jeremiah was offered a way out, but he chose to, friend, to stay with his friend Gedaliah. He seems to have had only three converts, Barak the scribe, Ebed-Melech, and Ahikam, and possibly Gedaliah. And while all this was going on, his contemporary Daniel was having a great time. And that's one of our problems too. You're sitting here saying, there's a congregation somewhere else and there's a situation somewhere else and everybody's having it great and we're not having it easy. God has a plan. And God knew that this poor guy, Jeremiah, would write the biggest book in the Bible that the prophecies he disclosed in relation to Jesus would be fulfilled thousands years later, or hundreds, I'm not very really sure how many years it was. But the potter's field, the 30 pieces of silver, all embedded in this book. Let God work out his agenda, his time. There's a verse in... Isaiah, I was looking at this afternoon, is chapter 5, verse 19. Be careful in the way you speak to God about telling him to hurry up. This is what Isaiah was saying. You're saying to God, please hurry up so that I may see it. that was wrong. Thy will be done on earth and in my life as it is in heaven. And we could apply what we've been saying about Jeremiah to the Lord Jesus himself. What a long time he took in coming. What a long time from the promises to the embryo to the 30 years to the three years of ministry to the cross to 12 chaps. It seemed, it seemed just, how is it that just this one man walked about for 30 years then he walked about another th three years with a few guys and changed the world. When God is doing something, it's tough and it takes time. And our privilege and responsibility is to be found this evening trusting in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. 
leaning not on our own understanding, and living for eternity. I mentioned in the morning uh, my good friend George Verwer, who passed away. And I sent a little thing I did from Jonathan Edwards to a friend of mine, John Piper. And John came back with a most beautiful email saying how tough it was for us to lose our friends like we've lost George Verwer. And then he said in his email, he said, William, at the end of your life, when you look back, time will be very short. So live for eternity and leave your burdens. Where? You know. You know where you're to leave your burdens. But do you do it? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The glory and the wonder is not in the result. The glory and the wonder is in the promise of his abiding presence. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. God sometimes takes a long time but in his clock, there's no time. I don't understand that, but it's a big help. Time was a creation ordinance. But time is not, he sees the end from the beginning. At the beginning, he sees the end. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. He does. He was pleased with Enoch. He was pleased with the lady with the alabaster box of ointment. And he's pleased with you when you are pleased with him. Delight yourself in God. Nothing more is asked of you. It's the question in that hymn is, isn't it? It's will your anchor hold? It's not, are you in a calm? It's not, is life easy? It's will your anchor hold? Is that where your hope is? In the promise, I'll never leave you. In the promise which has as its subtext, leave it all to me. Speaking with reverence, that's what God is saying to his people. Leave it all to me. I've got it all sorted. Delight yourself in God. You know the anchor. Some of you may have experience of it. Well, you're in the little boat and you're, you're fishing and the boat moves but it always keeps the head of the boat towards where the anchor is. Will your anchor hold? And how will your anchor hold? If you're delighting yourself in God. Friend, I hesitate to say to you, but it's what the Bible says, and it's what we've repeated in this world. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let us pray.
Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you for the, the story of Jeremiah. It's just, it's beyond our understanding how the man managed to do what he did and how he kept going with all the hassle and troubles and disappointments and the mocking. We thank you for his honesty. And we thank you for the call you give him and the promise you fulfilled for him. Give us to be thankful for your mercy to us today as this morning we thought about the excellency and glory of the unique Lord Jesus. And as we thought this evening about the experience of a fellow traveler who had enormous challenges and who could say, he does all things well. Grant that we would have the grace so to do and that we would echo these words that we sang in Psalm 13. But I have all my confidence Thy mercy set upon. My heart within me shall rejoice in thy salvation. Bless this congregation in your time for your glory, for their good, and for the awakening of a spirit of renewal in this community. Pardon us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we'll conclude by singing In Christ Alone.
from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands our destiny. That is altogether glorious for us. And we believe that Jeremiah knew something of that from yourself. May each of us know it in our own heart and that we would hear you saying to us, everything is in my hands. Pardon us for our sins. Bless and keep us for Jesus' sake. Amen.